أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم I seek refuge in God from Satan the accursed in the name of God the beneficent the merciful I offer my condolences over the martyrdom of the best of creation the Holy Prophet of Islam Muhammad bin Abdullah peace be upon him and the martyrdom of his eldest grandson, Imam Hassan Mustaba, peace be upon him. Though the more accurate date of this event is the 7th of Safar, I also express my condolences over the martyrdom of Imam Rida, peace be upon him. I offer my condolences to the Holy Savior, the promised Savior, Imam Al-Mahdi. May God's peace and blessings be upon him and may God hasten his advent. And I also send my condolences to all those people who suffer injustice due to the absence of these holy infallible personalities. My condolences also go to the believers anywhere they are, particularly the oppressed nations who suffer because of these afflictions. I send my condolences to all of them. I hope that by the grace of the Almighty God, the appearance of Imam al-Mahdi would be expedited so that all this injustice and oppression in the entire world comes to an end. The Holy Quran gives this description of the Holy Prophet of Islam. He will make good things lawful to them and prohibit all that is foul. This verse is so deep and profound. If you can see the correlation between this line and the actions of the Holy Prophet of Islam, you will be so proud and honored. The word tayyibat is all good things. And the word khaba'ath refers to whatever that is bad. What was the mission of the Holy Prophet of Islam? This is how the Holy Prophet is described. He makes lawful whatever that is good goodness in politics, social manners, military actions, domestic issues, and even goodness in mental and bodily health. And the Prophet prohibits anything that is foul. 
به بشر میگه برای شما حلال آزاد The Prophet has said no to whatever that is bad. The Prophet never did support anything that is bad and he never let any good thing to be prohibited. The foul approaches in politics, society, economy, in wartime and in peacetime. Whatever that is foul is prohibited by the Holy Prophet of Islam. Before I talk about the Holy Prophet of Islam, I have something to say about the glorious Arbain walk. I would like to thank all those people who had the honor to contribute to the Arbain pilgrimage. In any part of the world, either in Muslim or in non-Muslim countries. Particularly those who visited the shrine of Imam Hussein, peace be upon him. I thank all of them. Whatever they did will be recorded in their book of deeds. But I assume this to be my responsibility to thank all of them. All those people who helped pilgrims with transportation, residents, those who organized similar walks around the world, those who walked barefooted on this day, as traditions suggest this act, they walked barefooted for tens of kilometers to reach the holy city of Karbala. There were many processions around the world under the flag and the name of Imam Hussein, peace be upon him. Those who distributed foods among pilgrims, they selflessly gave whatever they had. Some people sold their houses and spent the money in this pilgrimage. They took loans to contribute to this pilgrimage. I thank all of them and as part of my religious responsibility, I pray for all of them. And I consider this to be a virtue for me. The Holy Infallible Imam, while shedding tears, prayed for these people in prostration. And this is proof of responsibility. I thank all of them and I pray for them all. Anyone who can hear me in any part of the world, they also need to try hard to help these pilgrims, pray for them so that they elevate, so that their ranks are elevated. This year's Arbain has finished, but everyone should look for those people who served in this pilgrimage in anywhere, particularly in the holy city of Karbala. So as to pay off their debts and give them donations. We need to help those people who came along with some political or financial issues and by doing this we can elevate our ranks before the Almighty God.
هر بحین امسال تموم شد اما هر کی میتونه دنبال کنه ببینه کی And this is a great honor for anyone who can pull this off and wow to those people who abstracted this Arbain walk. I read you this tradition I really quiver with fear while reading this. People are so ignorant. I should say that this tradition is a reliable one. There is no doubt for any Muslim in the world, not just the Shia. Since traditions from Sunnis and the Shias have said it many times, that the pilgrimage to Imam Hussein, peace be upon him, is merited more than the Hajj pilgrimage. There is no doubt about it. If you collect the traditions on this subject, they become a whole book. There are traditions on this subject in the so-called Siha Sitta indicating that Imam Hussein's pilgrimage is merited more than the Hajj pilgrimage. Obligatory Hajj is really important and though some scholars believe that Imam Hussein's pilgrimage is also obligatory, but the majority of the Shia scholars believe that pilgrimage to Imam Hussein is just recommended. Yet it is more important than all other recommended acts and deeds. Now let me read you this tradition. Ishaq bin Amar is a loyal and reliable companion of Imam Sadr, peace be upon him. This person is accredited by Sheikh Mufid and Sheikh Tusi and many other great Shiite scholars. One day, Ishaq bin Ammar narrated this story to Imam Sadiq, peace be upon him. He said that there was this old man who was very weak. He wanted to go to Hajj and he asked about the opinion of me. Knowing that he was a weak and old man, Ishaq said he doesn't need to go to Hajj. It was not an obligatory Hajj, it was a mustahab. Imam Sadiq answered like this. There are thousands of traditions from Imam Sadiq and other holy infallible Imams but this one is exceptional. He had said that the old person should not go to Hajj because he is weak and old. The Imam didn't simply say that he was wrong. Instead, he said, by saying this, you deserve to be sick one whole year.
And Ishaq said that he became sick for one whole year. No matter what he did, he did not recover for one whole year. Why? He was a famous and reliable companion of Imam Sadat. He has narrated hundreds of traditions from the Holy Imam Sadiq. But only because of saying no to Hajj pilgrimage. And this is good, since his punishment was not postponed to the hereafter. It was just one year and it passed. And now the pilgrimage to Imam Hussein is even more important than the Hajj. If someone says no to it, what would be the consequences? Those who prohibited this pilgrimage, where are they now? Harun was a big and powerful Abbasid ruler, and he used to tell that no matter where the clouds go, they reign in his kingdom. In his time, he was the most powerful dictator on earth. But where is he now? Most Abbasid rulers don't even have graves. Only Harun has a grave site, which is next to the grave of the Holy Imam Rida. But it is only a place where people go there and curse him. Harun killed so many people for visiting Imam Hussein's shrine. He put people in prison, tortured them. He himself whipped pilgrims of Imam Hussein, peace be upon him. Imam Ali, peace be upon him, has a prophecy about Mutawakkil, calling him the most vicious of them. I tell you two stories from Mutawakkil regarding the pilgrimage of Imam Hussein. The hardest time to visit Imam Hussein's grave was the time of the mutawakkil. It was quite a long time. Here's the first story. When these oppressive rulers were busy with other issues, people used this chance to settle at the shrine of Imam Hussein. Little by little, Karbala turned into a town. But very quickly, this town was destroyed and his people were arrested. Mutawakkil sent his special agent to Karbala in order to scare people away. This person went to Karbala and saw that a lot of people are living there. So he announced that all those settlers should be executed by the orders of Mutawakkil. He 
one of those settlers came close and said, we won't leave this place no matter what you do. You can have us all executed. But remember and know that more people will come to this place. When Mutawakkil heard of this, since he had other problems at hand, he ordered his agents to leave them alone. On another occasion, Mutawakkil sent another person to the city of Karbala. With the mission to remove these settlers from the area. That agent called out by the orders of Mutawakkil, all of you will put in Mutbaq prison. Allama Majlisi describes Mutbaq prison like this. This prison was founded by Mansur Dawaniqi and it lived on during the time of the Mutawakkil and thereafter. In the middle of deserts, digs were dug, and small rooms were made into the ground. These rooms were so small, one could hardly sit in them. These dungeons were called Al-Mutbiq. The pilgrims of Imam Hussein, peace be upon him, were put in these holes into the ground while they were chained to the ground. And these agents of the Abbasid government fed these prisoners so much so that they don't die and suffer more. And yet you see that Ibn Arabi praises Mutawakkil. The world must know about this. Ibn Arabi says that Mutawakkil is a ruler like the Prophet of Islam. And he is sanctioned by God like the God's messenger. Are these people really Muslims? Was Mutawakkil a Muslim? Imam Ali said that they all are infidels. And Mutawakkil was the most vicious of them. Those settlers who lived in Karbala at that time, they were not scared away by the threats of execution. But when they were threatened to be put in dungeons, all those settlers left the Karbala city. Just imagine that someone is pinned to the ground and they could not even sit. But where are these oppressive rulers now? Do you know where the body of Mutawakkil is buried? I have told many people who visit the city of Samara to go there and learn some lessons. This is God's doing. He gives time and respite to these vicious people and then acts strongly. 
I have once said this and I repeat it again. If you head towards Malwiya, starting from the Al-Askari Shrine in Samara, I have been there a couple of times. A few kilometers away from this city, you will see a very big desert. The people of Samara have given the desert the name of Caliphs because six Abbasid Caliphs are buried there. There is no sign of their graves in that barren land. But there are no signs of them anymore. It's such a pity that Imam Hussein's pilgrimage was obstructed in many countries. I don't mind the non-Muslim countries, but why the Muslim countries? They don't have the authority to ban people from going to the pilgrimage of Imam Hussein's shrine. In the past, people visited Imam Hussein's grave at the cost of dying. Their hands and legs were cut off. Can you imagine this at all? But never did the Imams stop people from going to this pilgrimage. Not only that, but also they encouraged the people. It was during the time of Mutawakkil that Imam Hadi, peace be upon him, asked for someone to visit the grave of Imam Hussein and pray for him. Imam Hadi knew well that it was a dangerous journey. Imam Hussein and everything related to this holy Imam is an exception. Instead of helping the pilgrims, they did this. They all will face the consequences of their actions. And if they are lucky, they'll meet their consequences in this world. And if not, the punishment is postponed to the hereafter, which is everlasting. A single mistake by a reliable companion of Imam Sadiq, he had advised against going to Hajj when speaking to a weak old man, and this mistake led to his illness for one whole year. Try to make the world familiar with this. The Prophet emphasized preaching in his sermon of Qadir. Use the cell phones you have to preach the message of Ahlul Bayt to the world, either in Muslim or non-Muslim countries. It is a responsibility. I thank all those people who contributed to the Arabian walk. Especially those who preached this event using TV networks and the social media. Preaching is very important. For 13 years, the Holy Prophet lived in Mecca and he preached Islam all the time. 
Even when the Holy Prophet was exiled to the suburbs of Mecca, the pagans had vowed to kill the Prophet if he appears in the town. But still, the Prophet negotiated with some people inside the city of Mecca. You can read the Prophet's history by yourself. You can read about it in Bihar al-Anwar, volume 14, 2022. The Prophet searched for people to give him refuge so that he could enter Mecca. The Prophet used to visit different tribes and he preached Islam to them. On one occasion, the Prophet visited tens of tribes in the suburbs of Medina and he preached Islam to all of them. But none of those Arabs accepted the Prophet's offer. Surely the Prophet already knew they would not accept his offer, but he did it anyway. We must learn from the Prophet of Islam. This is what Quran instructs us to do. Preach whatever you find good and denounce whatever that you find evil, relying on the teachings of the Holy Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them. There are many historical lessons we can take in this subject. I thank all people and I pray for them all. Try to support the TV networks, the ones that preach the thoughts and the message of the Holy Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them. Try to support them, even if by one word of encouragement. God will account for all of it, whether they are little or much. Esau ben Amar just said no to that old man and he was punished for it. But regarding the Holy Prophet of Islam, whatever that is said and written is not enough. I recommend the young believers, boys and girls, to read some books about the Holy Prophet of Islam. Even though none of these books can cover the entirety of the life of the Holy Prophet of Islam, the precious book by Sheikh Abbas Ramin named it is in Arabic, there might be Persian or English translations of it. Or even the book Muntah al-Amal, the parts about the Prophet's life. You should read them and then let the world know about them. You can speak, write or publish articles about the Prophet. You can talk on TV networks, radio programs, what have you. There are relative freedoms in the world today and we all have big responsibilities. All young believers, boys and girls have responsibilities. The Holy Quran reads, He will make good things lawful to them and prohibit all that is foul. What is the right way for a man to treat his woman? What is the right way for a woman to treat her husband? 
This is what the Holy Prophet wants, as he made good things lawful. What is the wrong way to treat your husband or wife? This is what the Holy Prophet prohibits. The parents and their children a chief of a tribe and his people, a CEO of a company and his employees, a teacher and his students, a salesman and the customers, a government leader and his nation, What are the good things they can do and what are the foul things to avoid? I will tell you this point and you can study it further if you want. For 10 years, the Holy Prophet of Islam was the head of a government in Medina. And in those 10 years, the Prophet had to deal with problems from within the Muslim community and also the wars that were ignited by pagans and others. I assume that no government in history has ever faced more threats and more problems than the government of the Holy Prophet of Islam. In the span of less than 10 years, these wars ended a year before the conquest of Mecca. The Holy Prophet had to defend against more than 80 wars. And in the meantime, hypocrites spied and leaked critical information to the enemies. In spite of all these problems, you gentlemen can follow up on this topic. In spite of all these issues and problems, no one died of hunger in those 10 years. Is it not a successful economy by the Holy Prophet of Islam? We cannot see this achievement by any country today, even Muslim and the non-Muslim countries. There are no reports of anyone dying of hunger at the Prophet's time. No one committed suicide because of poverty at the time of the Holy Prophet. There are many suicides that occur because of poverty in the world today, even in Muslim countries. Is it an economic achievement? Why isn't the world learning from the Holy Prophet of Islam? Part of it is because we fail to introduce Islam to the world. Sometimes it is because the other party is rebellious. And as the Quran says, they are a rebellious nation. The vicious rulers come and go, but should it be a trend? Is it an advice passed down from one vicious ruler to another to be bad and do evil things? No, that's not it. The Quran says they are just rebellious people. No kidnapping happened at the time of the Holy Prophet of Islam. 
Any paper you pick up and read in Muslim and non-Muslim countries, you come across many news about kidnappings. Some people kidnap little children, women and other people and ask for a big amount of money in return. Why didn't this happen during the time of the Prophet? Because the economy was healthy. And the governments of the Holy Prophet of Islam and Imam Ali, peace be upon them, you cannot find a single one of these problems. Muawiyah came across a puzzling issue and he could not know and he did not know how to handle it. So he asked someone to seek the answer from Imam Ali, peace be upon him, without saying that the question comes from Muawiyah. It was about a sexual criminal activity. The Imam answered, this criminal activity could not have happened in my territory. Imam Ali's territory reached to the deep parts of Europe and Africa and the entire Middle East, excluding Syria, which was controlled by Muawiyah. Imam said that such a criminal act could not have happened in my territory. The Prophet's government showed a successful economy. The Prophet's government showed a successful political approach. The Prophet didn't let water be cut off even from his enemies. The Prophet was told by some Muslims that Muslims can surrender the enemy by blocking water into their camps, but the Holy Prophet refused to do so. Is it not the ultimate level of humanity and ethics? The Prophet said, you cannot fight for God by committing sins. In the Battle of Safin, even before the war had started, the army of Muawiyah captured the water spring. Imam Ali and his army fought them and took over the spring. Muawiyah and Amr bin As were terrified because they thought that Imam Ali would retaliate and block water. But they both admitted that Imam Ali would not do such a thing. And this is why Muawiyah is a vicious person, because he knew Imam Ali was right and he still fought him. Is it not the ultimate level of humanity and ethics displayed by Imam Ali, peace be upon him? And now just look around and see what Muslim countries are doing to each other. This is not the real Islam. The Holy Prophet himself said that there will be only a name of Islam left in future. Everyone has some responsibility. I have said this before, let me say it again. The dear youths can study about this. 200 years ago, there was this Christian priest in Urumiya city in Iran. He administered, he administered all chapels in Urumiya and he was an active and sharp person. And it is said that when he was 12, 
He be- became a priest. But a couple of young Shia believers held talks with this priest and he converted to Shia Islam and his name became Muhammad Sadiq. This priest used to travel around Iran and he delivered lectures to the Christians. It was 200 years ago. It was the time of Kashif al ghita and the author of Jawahir before Sheikh Ansari and the great Mirza Shirazi. This person could guide thousands of Christians to Shia Islam. There is a book about him which was published 10 years ago. This person wrote a book Bayan al Haq, which is 10 volumes. Two volumes have been published and I had one of the two volumes. I found this book and I gave it to my late brother because he was writing a book about the life of the Holy Prophet of Islam. The fourth volume of this book is particularly addressing the life of the Holy Prophet of Islam. This former Christian priest documented miracles from the Holy Prophet of Islam which he could find in the Gospels and the other scriptures. The fourth volume of the book is expandable and it could become ten volumes today. Eight volumes of the book are missing. They might have been burned or lost forever. Maybe the dear youth in non-Muslim countries can help. I myself have seen that a book by Allah Mahali, the original copy of this book, is kept at a library in some non-Muslim country. Probably it was stolen. Or maybe a Muslim person has sold the book for a cheap price. The book Bayan al Haq is 10 volumes. And you see, preaching is very important. Some young Shia believers in Urumiye held talks with this Christian priest, and he converted to Shia Islam and he wrote this precious book. It is obligatory for all Muslims to introduce the Holy Prophet of Islam to the world. It is a collective duty, and so long as it is not fulfilled, everyone is bound by this responsibility. Dear young believers, you need to learn about the Prophet's life by reading or learning from others and then act upon it and then let the world know about it as well. The Holy Prophet of Islam and the Holy Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them, are quiet, unknown to the world. 
There are many media outlets that spread lies about the Holy Prophet of Islam. They have such huge coverage. And they are funded by many countries. And their job is to spread lies about the Holy Prophet of Islam. I don't like to mention these lies about the Prophet of Islam. The Prophet was the most pious and pure person in history of humankind. Yet they accuse him of such ugly and heinous things. They have TV networks, magazines, and books, and they use them to distort the image of the Holy Prophet of Islam. A couple of months ago, in a neighboring Muslim country, a Nasabi insulted the Holy Imam Ali, peace be upon him. He lied about the Holy Imam. Then he was arrested because some believers filed a case, filed a case against him. And he was sentenced to prison. But the followers of this Nasibi put pressure on the judge, and his prison sentence was revoked. We, all of us, men and women, need to enlighten the world. The youths have time and energy, they can pull this off. The months of Safar and Muharram end in one or two days. These two months of mourning and its remainder, that is the 8th of Rabi al-Awwal, which marks the martyrdom of Hazrat Mohsen and Imam Hassan al-Askari, these are the days of mourning. But beginning on the 9th of Rabi al-Awwal, there will be the days of happiness. It is a principle of our faith to mourn and celebrate alongside the Holy Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them. It is a religious duty to make these things public. The world, even many Muslims, are unaware of these realities. Traditions tell us to celebrate the ninth of Rabi al-Awwal, and this is a divine tradition from the Almighty God. A celebration is to manifest your happiness and show it publicly. Tawali and Tabari are principles of our faith. And them being minor principles don't mean that they are insignificant. Reach out to the young people anywhere they are. We are losing some young people, many of whom are simply misinformed. Parents need to be more careful about their children. Teachers need to care more about their students. And the young believers themselves, they need to interact with other young people. Try to help the young boys and girls in your family, at your workplace and elsewhere. Spend time with other young people and try to guide them to the right path. Try to talk to them, introduce them to experts. There were many hypocrites at the times of the Holy Prophet of Islam and Imam Ali, but the believers 
were kept safe from them. Yet, we are losing our youths to the hypocrite community. Some young people have stopped practicing Islam and their beliefs have become corrupt. Part of it is because of the corrupt TV networks, which spread lies about Islam, the Quran, and the Holy Prophet of Islam. But part of it is because of the young people who don't fulfill their responsibilities. If a young person refuses to accept the truth, you need to insist. On one occasion, the Holy Prophet visited 17 tribes and they all rejected the Prophet. However, the Prophet did not stop preaching. The Quran instructs us to learn from the Holy Prophet of Islam. Those who study at seminaries and universities, they need to increase their learnings so that they can have better results. Of course, the elderly also have their own responsibilities. The scholars and rulers have bigger responsibilities, though. Two groups decide the prosperity or the wretchedness of a nation, scholars and the rulers. Scholars are usually a point of reference by other people, and therefore they have bigger responsibilities. And governments, since they have money and military, they can be very influential. And so rulers have bigger responsibilities. The same is true about scholars. But it doesn't mean that other people don't have responsibilities. Each man and woman, young or old, they all have responsibilities. Try to reach out to the youths in your family, in your relatives, if they have issues with their beliefs, try to help them. Another thing is the issue of marriage. Try to use these times of the happiness of the Holy Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them, at your schools, universities, workplaces, and your families and relatives. Find the single young believers and encourage them and help them to get married. Try to mediate their marriage, help them find a good couple. Imam Sajjad, peace be upon him, who went through so much suffering in his life, this holy Imam says that in Islam, marriage is so easy. But now it's become so ceremonial. Imam Sajjad says that Islam has made marriage so easy. That two people can get married while eating a stew. Imam Sajjad 
The Prophet recited the marriage testimony for a person while the person had only a ring made of iron to give as mah or gift to his wife. Another person who was a very poor person, he could not provide anything to give as gift to the wife. So the Prophet told him that he can teach some verses from the Holy Quran to his wife instead of giving her a gift. Now, why has marriage become so ceremonial and difficult in Muslim countries? What's the reason behind the rising rates of divorce? We need to enlighten people about the real Islam. I remember that 60 years ago in the holy city of Kabbalah, it was such an easy thing to get married. All young people could get married in less than two months. No matter what kind of jobs they had, whenever they wanted to get married, they did so with no problems. Why has marriage become so difficult and expensive? When the young boys and girls reach puberty, they really need to get married. If not, they will either commit sins or they just suppress their feelings and as a result of this, they become sick. Everyone sh should do something and help facilitate a marriage. Try to help the youth in your family to get married. See what their problems are. Try to convince the young believers to not delay their marriage. It is a responsibility of all people. If we fail to do it, we will be regretful in the afterlife. Traditions say that if someone helps another person to get married, for every step they take, they will be rewarded abundantly. The dear youth should also make this happen. The dear boys and girls, they can also help their single friends get married. This is the real Islam. The Holy Prophet said that other things do not relate to Islam. They just carry the name of Islam. If you write the word bread on a piece of paper, you cannot eat it. If you write the word water on a piece of paper, you cannot drink it. The Prophet has said that what remains from Islam in future is just the name of Islam. I hope that Almighty God gives this honor to everyone so that what they have gained in these two months of mourning, Muharram and Safar, they can keep it alive in the remaining ten months and practice Tawali and Tabari all together.
May God bless Muhammad and his pure household.